Good morning. Morning. It's not morning anymore. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Canvas Church. If you're joining us on the live stream, welcome to you as well. Um, yeah, awesome. If you're able to, I'll invite you to stand with us as we begin to worship this evening. I said it right this time. It's the evening. Um, yeah, and just beginning with this, uh, uh, reading this psalm. Uh, psalm 42, it feels appropriate today because it's extremely warm. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so just reading from Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants uh, for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Yeah, so Father God, we, ja we gather together in your name and uh, whatever kind of week it is that we've been coming out of, God, I pray that you would help us to just turn our eyes to you and, uh, and to just worship you with everything that we have, the best that we can bring, God, because that is, uh, that is what you are worthy of. And whether our best looks the same as everybody else's or uh, 
just, again, just the best that we are able to do. Uh, God, help us to give that to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. You are good. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. All right, let's worship together. Did I? 
Let the word of Christ my Savior dwell in me today. May his goodness be reflected in all I do and say. Let the wisdom of my Father be the light upon my way. May his spirit always guide me. I am willing to obey. Let the love of Jesus fill me like water fills the sea. Let my whole life be a mirror of the mercy shown to me. Let the peace of God, my Father, rule in everything. That I might learn to trust Him, enjoy our sorrow.
mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to it And spoke your name into night And through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ my living spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings called me his own beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Sing that again. Then came the morning. In the morning, I see the promise. Your very body. Has no place. 
together one more time. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Amen. Thank you for leading us in worship tonight. Worship is such a gift. It is such a gift. Before I lead us in prayer tonight, I was thinking this afternoon what I was going to lead us in prayer for. <laughs> and I felt the Lord just really prompt me to just share with all of you. And the only reason I'm sharing this is I hope it encourages somebody. The last number of months in my life have been very hard. I have fought and fought and fought against discouragement and disappointment. Um, some of you know Rob and I moved back from the UK almost a year ago now, and it's been a hard year. <laughs> it's been a hard year. And I've just been slammed with disappointment and looking back over my life and just feeling a lot of regret. And I know what the scriptures say. <laughs> And I know where to place my hope, but it doesn't change how you feel sometimes. And to just ignore those feelings doesn't help either. But what I want to share with you tonight is the value and the importance of worship and the Word of God. We ran into friends today, we're out for a walk, and she said, I don't know how people who do not have Christ have hope, how they face their days. And I'm just so thankful that I have hope because I have Jesus. And I have to hold on to the truth in his word and allow my heart and my soul to worship even when I don't feel like it. So I just have a couple of scriptures. Jake, thank you for sharing. Where did he go? He's here somewhere. There he is. That scripture out of the Psalms, why are you downcast, my soul? Why? And just bringing that to God. And I wanted to share with you just scriptures out of the Psalms. If you're discouraged, open up the Word of God and read the Psalms. I went through the Psalms this afternoon, and I cannot tell you how many verses I have underlined in the Psalms that talk about hope. And that's my encouragement to all of you is worship and be in the Word. Be in the word. So before I lead us in prayer, I just want to read a couple of scriptures out of the Psalms. This is out of Psalm 33, and the first one is verse 4 that says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. What a good verse to hold on to. And the second is verses 20 through 22. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let's pray. Father, you are so deserving of our worship and our praise. God, you are so faithful to us. Father, life is hard. We recognize that. But God, you've given us everything we need. Everything we need, God. And it's my prayer tonight, Father, that if there's anybody in this room that is feeling that they are the only ones <laughs> the only ones who are facing discouragement or disappointment or regrets, God, I pray that they would turn to you, 
they would cry out to you and they would know that you hear their cry. God, would you reveal yourself as the God of hope, the God who sees, the God who knows, the God who loves, and the God who is good all the time. God, we so long to know you more. And Father, whatever we face in life, we know that you are doing your best for our lives. God, you're the only one who knows. And may we run the race before us, strong until the end. We'll keep our eyes on Jesus and run the race to win. May your beauty rest upon us as we seek to win the lost. May we be faithful servants to the message of the cross. Amen. Andrea, our, our, our world needs hope, and, uh, and I hope when they see uh, us as Christians, uh, they see that in us. It doesn't mean that we're bouncing around just, <laughs> you know, like hyper happy all the time, but it means that we've got something that sustains us through whatever comes at us and, and, and grounds us and gives us that peace. And so, uh, so if you don't have that tonight, uh, it's my prayer that, uh, that you would come to encounter God in such a way that, that you would have that. Um, so glad that you, you guys are here tonight. And uh, we, uh, uh, if, if you've not been to, uh, to Canvas Church before, we're so glad that you're here. Um, we are a church that uh, really, really what, what we aim for is to help people discover their, uh, their part in the uh, story, family, and mission of God. So the story of God being uh, what God's been doing long before we got on the scene and what he'll be doing long after we exit stage right. Uh, we're part of what God is doing, and it's something much bigger than any of us, uh, uh, you know, sometimes maybe notice just in our own lives, uh, but also the, the family of God, that we, we don't live out our purpose alone. Uh, but we're meant to be part of a, a greater family. And, and that's kind of what this is, right? We, we go out into the community and we're, we're doing our different things. And uh, we sort of say that this is sort of like, like family dinner, right? So we get together, like family's kind of doing their thing. And then you get together at the, around the dinner table. That's kind of what, what this is, right? And uh, I, I joke with uh, Gary and Rona. Um, we're asking everybody, hey, you know, help sort of take all this down at the end of the night. We call that doing the dishes. <laughs> it was like family dinner. Thankful for you guys helping us do the dishes. We've been getting out of here. Jake and I and Kim been able to get out of here earlier just when we all help. And part of being a family, you go through tough times, but but you go through them with others. Uh, and then part of the mission of God, that you're not, just, uh, you're not just meant to be on this earth to sort of get everything you can get out of it, but to, to see what, what does God want me to give? There's a couple of things I'll mention again at the, uh, at the end of the service. Uh, a couple of ways that we're going we're gonna to do that. Family Fest is a, is a gift to our community. And then uh, this backpack initiative that uh, we're, we're partnering with some folks in our city to, uh, to give school supplies and backpacks to, uh, uh, to kids that are coming out of single family homes that uh, it can be expensive to, to put together all the school supplies. And so we're like, hey, we, we want to be part of helping uh, bless families in that way. So I'll mention some of that uh, a little bit later. But I want to introduce you to some of you probably, many of you already know, but, uh, but my, my parents are in town this week, and, uh, and whenever my parents are in town over a Sunday, uh, I love to get my dad to come up and, uh, and preach for me. I, I grew up uh, listening to my dad preach, and, uh, and oftentimes we were, his, uh, we were his illustration material, <laughs> the stuff that we did, gave him all sorts of things to talk about, and, uh, and so it's, uh, it's uh, always such a, a pleasure for me to, to turn over this time uh, to my dad uh, as somebody who, uh, who really, who travels around the world sharing insights out of, out of scripture, but, but at the same time, his, his favorite thing to do is, is just get around folks and open up the scriptures. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I think that's cool. I think it's cool that uh, somebody could 
go all around the world, but get just as excited to, to come to the Monterey Center, speak to Canvas Church. And so, uh, so Dad, why don't you come? And uh, excited to have you uh, share with us tonight. What, what is really great to be here, and I, wa- I think some of you know, I watch that your service almost every Sunday. If I'm home or if I'm in my hotel room on the road somewhere, I tune in because uh, it's, it's 9 o'clock my time, usually in Eastern time. And so 9 o'clock, I know to tune in and watch. And so, but I, nev- I never get to see you. I just get to see the team up here. So I've got, I can hear some you know, cat calls now and then and some <laughs> clapping and laughter, but it's good to see you because yeah, uh, uh, I pray for your church every week. And, I, and I, I, we, Lisa and I both, uh, watch the services. Lisa usually waits the next day, and then she goes through it all. And and uh, just a, so we just feel like we've journeyed with you as a church, and and just watch God work in uh, some wonderful ways. And so what a blessing. And, and Andrew, I really appreciate your sharing because that you, what you kind of led us through is exactly what I felt led to talk about tonight. Is that in life I've just found that you know, I was I think I was saying to each of my kids as they were going out into the world as adults. I said now. Two things you're going to discover, that in life there will be disappointments. I, just, I, I wish there weren't, but I, just, I, I know there will be. And when you watch your kids going out in the world, and you wish they would never be disappointed, but there are just things in life you, you wish you could hit rewind and go back and maybe do it again or change the circumstances, but you can't. I don't, I've never met a person who doesn't have regrets, that wishes life had been a bit different and, and oftentimes, but, but the other thing you find out about life is now and then there are also pleasant surprises, things you hadn't counted on that God just chooses just to bless you with. And I want to talk to you about that tonight because that's just part of what life is, is about. You know, and, and, a, and a much lighter note, speaking of disappointment, my wife Lisa and I have been looking forward to coming here for months so we could escape the heat in Georgia <laughs> and come up here and enjoy a nice, cool Victoria summer day, week, but uh, so we've uh, worked, we're living out the disappointment this week, uh, but, uh, but I wanted, uh, and I also, as Mike said, if I had not had Mike as a child, I would have had, I would have had just terrible illustrations all through my public speaking career, but Mike kept me with lots of fodder every week. I could, couldn't keep up with all the illustrations, so I thought it'd only be appropriate just to at least share one Mike story here, because... <laughs> Only, only his parents can tell some of the stories that we can tell about him in front of all of his people. But, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to excitement and anticipation, probably one of the most exciting moments in my life was when I discovered, Lisa and I discovered, that we were expecting Mike. Now, back in that day, in the, you know, in the Jurassic Park time era, there was no... There was no, uh, you didn't, I, we didn't know what we were going to have. We didn't know if Mike was a Mike or a Melody at that point, but we just knew that, that a child was coming, and uh, we were so excited. You know, I was 24 years old when he was going to be born, and he's our oldest child, so it's our first, first time round to, to have a child, and, and so, of course, it's a big deal. We're really excited, and, and a, a, now Lisa can knows the details on this better than I do. She, was, she had a small role to play in the birthing process. <laughs> but uh, but he might came a little early, a little early uh, than we anticipated. And, uh, and actually that day, was we, I, we were in Texas. I was going to seminary, and I, my, my classes had ended for the summer, so I had jumped on a lawn mowing crew just to make a little extra money to get my tuition for the fall. And so I'm pushing a lawnmower, and it's 100 plus degrees weather, Fahrenheit, all day long. So you're pushing a lawnmower. I did it all day long, 100 plus degrees. Lisa went to work in the downtown Fort Worth, worked a full eight hour shift that day because we weren't expecting Mike quite that soon. And I get, we, I get home, and then I'm playing on the church softball team. So I played a softball game that evening. And by the time I got home, like 11 o'clock at night, I'm getting into bed, like just bone tired. I've been out in this. Texas, 100 degree weather, and I'm just starting to just relax and go to sleep when Lisa announces that she needs an escort to the hospital because our son is on his way. That would not be the last night that Mike kept us up all night, but that was the, that was the, that was the first one. And so we go to the hospital, 
And, uh, and it is, you know, all the way there, we're giddy. I mean, you, those of you who are parents know what I'm talking about, that first trip to the hospital, so excited, if we'd only known, you know, but we didn't know that. And so, so we, we actually are really excited about this process, and we're laughing and giddy, and of course, Lisa's starting to have contractions, and so it's not quite as much fun for her, but, but uh, we're having fun, and we're, we're, we're laughing, and we're going to find out if this is a boy or a girl, what's going to happen, and all of these things we've wondered about for all this time, our first child, we're going to be parents, um, and, then, and, th- and then things don't always go like you plan, do they? And I thought, you know, in a, an hour or so, we'll be calling all everybody and letting them know. <laughs> We've been up all day long. Both of us have worked all day long. And that, that, that uh, labor process goes for 12 and a half hours. It goes all the way through the night, into the morning, into the afternoon. And, uh, and then, and now we're kind of, some of the, the joy is sort of tapering off a little bit, but we're still kind of excited. And uh, then what we didn't realize, as the contractions are getting more severe, um, what we didn't, of course, know is that Mike's umbilical cord was right here around his neck. And every time the contractions were getting worse, he would, he would kind of crunch up like this, and he cut off his oxygen supply. And so all of a sudden, he, there's a big contraction. He, he kind of, I guess he goes up like this, and it just cuts off his oxygen flow. And they've got a monitor on his heart rate. They've got one on Lisa's. And Mike's heart rate just starts plummeting. And, and we're sitting there just expecting any moment. And then all of a sudden, I'll never forget, the nurse put, gets on the intercom, calls for an emergency. And suddenly, all these medical people are running into the room. They grab hold of the bed that Lisa is in. And they just push the whole bed out of the room. And they run at a full run. They're running down the hallway. They hit this sort of dividing door. It just bursts open. They push it through. And then the door closes. And I'm 24 years old. I don't, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm just completely out of my league here. I don't know what to do. I don't know if I'm supposed to run after them, if I'm allowed to go back there. I, now I would have run after them, but I'm just standing there like my jaw dropped, like, wh- what do I do? And, the, and all of a sudden, my wife is gone, my baby is gone, there's nobody there, and, uh, and the last thing I saw was just Mike's heart rate just going down to nothing, and I have no idea. Did he survive? Did my wife survive? No one said a word to me. Like I was, There's nobody left but me standing in the hallway by myself. I didn't know where to go. I just kind of want, and I thought to myself, only 12 hours ago, we were just giddy with excitement and joy, and we're laughing, and wow, sometimes life can just take a sharp turn so quickly, can it? We're all just one phone call away, one doctor's visit away, one talk with our boss away from life suddenly going from joyful to heartbroken, are we not? And I'm just, all I knew to do, I just kind of wandered out. I found my way back out to the waiting room. And I got out to the waiting room. It's just crowded with people. There's all kinds of noise and kids shouting and parents yelling at their kids. And, and I'm just in a daze. I just sort of dropped in my chair. And all I could think to do was just pray for my wife and my child. God, spare my child. Just help him, to, help him or her to live. But Lord, whatever, whatever you do, I'll send him to a monastery if you'll just let him live. You know, like after when he became a teenager, I remembered that vow. I said I should, should have sent him to a monastery. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I, I, th- this crowded room, I, I went from the height to the depths in 12 hours, I, from the most excited I'd ever been to the most depressed and discouraged I'd ever been, just 12-hour difference. And um, I'll never forget, in all the noise, all of a sudden, I, I thought I heard my, my name. And I, I look around, and there's all these people in there. And then I looked over, and I saw a, a nurse standing, just had, uh, had opened up a door. There's a nurse standing in the doorway. She's got a mask on, a hat on, you know, all the scrubs of, of nursing. And she's holding a little wrapped up baby. And I realized she's calling me to come meet my child. And you can put that, you got a picture up there, don't you? So this is not, this is not his birth picture, but um, I thought you'd like this because we didn't know, even as, what is he, at least as six months or something like that, at, at, that, that he was being prepared even as a child to be working at Canvas. And he's, a, he's already in a sailor outfit. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so, so we should have known if we could have only looked in the future then. 
Uh, but, I'll, but, you know, that has kind of been part of the life experience for us is you get your hopes up and you sort of picture how life will be. And then life isn't always how you thought it would be, is it? Um, but you just have to kind of hold on to God. And, and it may not be the life you thought it would be, but with God it always ends up being good. And I want you to see a, a, a great example. By the way, I love the series Mike's been doing. I know all the series. Mike keeps telling me, he'll say, well, you know, we had someone in our service a few weeks ago. I said, Mike, I know. I watch all your services. But he forgets because I'm not physically in the room. But, but I, love the, I love the series of just, uh, is it a roadblock or just a speed bump? It seemed like a roadblock hit us in our childbirthing process when he was born. But it ended up being a road bump. And now we look at his life now and all that God has done. And uh, we're so grateful that, that there was more to the story than what it seemed at the moment. And I want you to look at a, a passage in Genesis chapter 12. It's a, it's a really well-known passage. But, you know, sometimes you go back to a passage you've read many times before. And you see things you hadn't seen before. And that's kind of what I found here. Uh, and I want to just walk you through um, this chapter for the next few moments. Because... You're going to see someone who had some great expectations and then he hit what looked like a roadblock and by God's grace it just became a speed bump. Genesis 12, it's, the first three verses say, The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives and your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, I want you just to see, we, we know these. These are some of the most famous verses probably in the Old Testament where God comes to Abram and says, let me tell you the plans I have for you. Can you imagine if God comes to you and, he's, and he tells you this? I'm going to make your name great. Of course, he's not saying he's going to make him famous. He's saying I'm going to make you have a great character. Your name represented who you were, your character. He said, I'm going to make you a great person. And you're going to be a, when you become all that I intend for you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth. What, that's pretty exciting, right? Um, and I just want you to see a couple of things about this. When, when God first starts walking with Abram, it is really exciting. And I found so many times when God starts something in our hearts, it, it's, it's exciting because God is, going to do something, and, and that's always exciting. But it doesn't always turn out quite like you thought it would. And, uh, and so here God says, comes to Abram, and there's just a couple things to notice. One is God's going to take Abram to Canaan, to the promised land. And at, at that time, it may be the most wicked part of the, of the earth. I mean, there, there is, they've got they have kind of a, a, a human-made religion. And so they've come up with their own kind of religion. And you can tell it's kind of a man-made religion because the, the, when you would worship Baal, the god Baal, the idol Baal, you'd go to a temple and they might have temple prostitutes. And you would go have relations with a prostitute and that would be your worship service. Now, you talk about depraved religion. And there were gods who would come and they would, and the way you, you please these gods is you would bring them one of your babies and they would burn the baby on an altar and you would give up one of your children so that he would bless your crops and you'd have a good harvest. Now you think about how depraved of a religion you have to have to sacrifice your own children so you can be wealthy and have a good crop. And of course, Sodom and Gomorrah they were in their heyday this, at this time. Sodom and Gomorrah, perhaps the most evil cities in history, are at their evilest. Th that's the land that God says, Abram, I'm going to take you there. I'm going to give you that land. If I were Abram, I would say, do you have any other lands you might want to give me? Like, that's not the land I think I want to inherit. But you know what's exciting to me? Whenever you see evil in a land, whenever you see a, a, a land, a nation that really needs God, God's never intimidated by that. God saw perhaps the most evil land at that time, and he said, I'm going to give that to Abram. I'm going to claim that land. 
And so he calls Abram and he says, I'm going to give that to you. And, and by the way, notice when God decides to, to take over, to claim a very evil nation, an evil a bunch of nations, you know what God does? He doesn't send a preacher, does he? Who does he send? Sends a business person, an ordinary working person. Don't you like that? He sends a shepherd. I love that. You know, we always think he'd send a Billy Graham into Canaan, right? He sends a business guy. And, and, and I, I may have shared with you before when I've been here, but, but I spend a lot of time working with business people. That's kind of a lot of where I spend my time working these days. And it is so exciting to see what God's doing through business people. Um, we keep praying, God, send more Billy Graham type evangelists. But historically, biblically, what God always does is he raises up ordinary people and he puts them in evil, dark places. And he says, let me show you the difference. By the way, <coughs> you've got Canaan, probably the most evil, corrupt, depraved region in the world. How many godly business people do you think you'd need to send in there to make a difference? He sends one and his wife. One man and his wife and says, that, that's all I need to turn things around here. Aren't you excited about how many, pe how many godly people does God need in Victoria, Oak Bay, to make a difference in this place? You'd think God would have sent an army in. He sends a couple in. Don't ever underestimate what God can do with a godly couple. You know, by the way, it was, uh, it's Zechariah 4.10 that says, Who has despised um, the day of small things? Um, God loves to just take small things, a couple, an individual, a new church plant, and God says, let me show you what I can do with just a small group that is serious with me. But third thing just to notice is that this is the first time in the Bible that God speaks to Abraham, uh, to Abram. We, we, he may have spoken to him before, but this is the first record of that happening. And, and so it may well be that Abram is a, a relatively new believer. I mean, you, want to call him, he's, you wouldn't call him a Christian then, but he's a God follower, a believer in God, but but he's brand, he may be brand, this might be the first time God's ever talked to him. And you know what kind of excites me about that? You don't have to have been a Christian for 40 years before God can do something through your life. Some of the most exciting things God's ever done has been to a relatively new believer who didn't know better than just to trust God. With God, all things were possible. And they were just so thrilled at what God was doing in their life that God just used them in awesome ways. So I've never underestimated what God can do through a brand new believer. Don't, don't ever think, well, I'm not, I've never been to seminary like Mike, you know. I, I've, I don't know the Bible like some of the others here in this church. Doesn't matter. I mean, it's great to know the Bible. <coughs> but I'm telling you, God comes to Abram maybe the first time he's ever had a conversation with God, for all we know. And God says, just come with me. Let me show you what I can do. I'll tell you what, that's exciting when God says that. Well, a fourth thing just to point out, and th this is kind of interesting to me because uh, when God says to Abram, he says, now follow me and, I'm, and, and I'll take you to, you know, just follow me, I'll tell you where we're going when we get there. I don't know how many of you could do that. How many of you could pack a, a U-Haul truck and then God tell you, just start driving, I'll tell you where to go. <laughs> but that's kind of what he says to Abram. He says, I'll show you where, you just get going. And lo and behold, he takes him to Canaan which is hundreds of miles away. Uh, Abram actually was born in Ur, which is not that far from ancient Babylon. It, it would be in modern-day Iraq. And God's going to take him from Iraq all the way into Israel, uh, hundreds of miles away. And, but if you go back in the previous chapter, chapter 11, verse 30 or so, uh, 31, Abram's father, Terah, was living in Ur, and, and it says that Terah took Abram and Sarah and Lot, and he was going to move to Canaan. He, he, his, Abram's father wanted to go to Canaan, but he only got as far as Haran, which is like just down the road a ways, and then he never got any further. And I've always wondered, why didn't Terah go all the way to Canaan? He started there, and we have no idea why he left. Like Ur, people say that in, in Abram's time, the people in Ur worship a moon god. Their god was a moon god. So Abram would have, as a child, would have lived in an, at least a culture that worshipped the moon. Maybe Terah got tired of sending Abram to public school 
and being indoctrinated in moon worship. You know, maybe Tara just thought, we got to get out of here. All he hears about is a moon god. I'm not so sure. I, we don't know why, but Tara said, I'm taking my son out of here. We're going to Canaan. But Tara never got there. Tara dies in Haran, hundreds of miles away from where he intended to go. And I've thought a lot about that because what it, what it seems to me is when Abram finally enters Canaan, I just wonder if he didn't think to himself, my dad always wanted to come here. My dad used to talk about this place. He never made it. He never got here. You, you just wonder what went through Abram's heart as he walked up and down through Canaan thinking, oh, my dad would have loved to have seen this place. He never got here. Now he got Abram on the way. He got Abram closer than where Abram was born, but he never got him in the land. And do you know what, I've, what I feel like? Is that part of what God calls us to do as parents is to help our kids get farther with God than we got. That they advance farther than we ever got and we ever made it. I don't know about some of you. Some of you I know had Christian parents and they wanted to pass on the faith. Some of you perhaps didn't have Christian parents, Christian background. You know, I've got a friend, he's a businessman, and his dad had wanted nothing to do with, with God, nothing to do with Christianity, but he became a Christian. And he, um, and he got real on fire for Jesus, and he and I have become good friends. And one day, his dad died, and he, got, he inherited his dad's stuff. And he's digging through boxes, and he found a box from his grandfather that he never really knew. And you know what his, his dad's dad was? He was a preacher. And his dad never told him because his dad apparently was a prodigal. His dad rejected his father's faith and religion, went the other way, never told his son, by the way, you come from a line of preachers because his dad kind of said, we're, we're, that's the end of that for us. And now all of a sudden my friend discovers, you know, all these years I've just had this drawing to God I, I, I don't even know how I became a Christian. Then all of a sudden he goes back in his family tree and he discovers his grandfather used to pray for him. His grandfather prayed for his salvation. You know, it might surprise you, some of you. You might not have had Christian parents at all, but if you went back up line your family tree, you might just find you had a great-grandmother who prayed for you before she ever knew who you were. And I've always wondered how much of my blessing in my life is because of people maybe I never knew, that they, they kind of moved in the direction of God and then I got the benefit because they did. But so Tara is moving toward Canaan. He never gets there, but Abram will. And then lastly, just notice that, that God comes to Abram and he says, basically, I want to fulfill your life's purpose. Now, do, do you, someone tell me what Abram's name means. What does the name Abram mean? Exalted father. Yeah. So how would you now he's gonna how when how old is he when he becomes a father? A hundred, right? So how would you like to be, say, 75 years old and everyone's calling you, hey, exalted father? <laughs> Can you imagine your friends are probably snickering like, whoa, did they ever misname that guy? You know, exalted father, he didn't even have one kid. Uh, he's 99 years old. Can you, can you imagine him, you know, just hating his parents? Why, why did they call me that, you know? I've been called exalted father all my life and I don't even have one child. Like, uh, and, and God comes and says, you know what? Your parents, they had it right in the first place. By the way, do you know what Zacchaeus' name? Remember Zacchaeus, the notorious tax collector, like the worst sinner in all of Jericho? His name actually means something like pure. And so it's like talking about misnamed person, right? And yet his parents had it right, right? Eventually Zacchaeus will find his purpose, his calling, and he will become pure. He will become righteous. It just takes him a while. And, and so when God comes to Abram, he says, you know what, you've been called exalted father. Let me tell you what we're going to do here. You, you follow me. I'll make sure that every purpose God has for your life, you will fulfill, you'll experience before you die. And so he starts a journey. Uh, by the way, it's interesting, you know, in those last two, ver verse 2 and 3, the, the word bless or blessing is mentioned five times. Like five times in two verses. What do you think God, do you think God's trying to make a point there? When God keeps saying bless over and over again, what, what, 
He's got it on his heart, right? And I think what God's saying is this. He's saying, listen, Abraham, when you, when you fulfill God's purpose for your life, you will be blessed, but a lot of other people will be blessed too. Whenever you get God's will right for your life, other people are going to be blessed because of it. I've just found that over and over. By the way, that's one good reason to be in a church. Because when you're following God in the church, guess what? Everybody else in the church gets blessed too. And when you get around other people and you're, 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 you're pursuing God, other people are going to catch in on the blessing at the same time. And so God comes to him and he says, listen, um, if you do it my way, a lot of people are going to get blessed. So just go with me. And so, by the way, my, you know, my, my, that's how I grew up. My, my dad, when he was, uh, he was pastoring a church in California when I was just a, a little kid, and a, a little church in Canada called my dad in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and they said, they only had like 10 people, and they said, we'd, we'd like you to be our pastor. Now, the church my dad was in was a lot bigger than 10 people, um, so it was kind of a downward move for my dad. And a lot of people came to my dad and said, are you crazy? Like, why would you take, we got a picture, I think, of my dad, kind of, yeah, like that, we had another, my dad had another son before we moved to Canada. That real cute looking one is me there next to my dad, but, um, and uh, then we had a sister on the way by the time we moved there. Uh, everybody said my dad was crazy. It kind of reminds me of Abraham, because everyone said, listen, in fact, someone, t- two, two men drove down to my dad, to where he lived, and they said to my dad, like, are you crazy? Like, why would you leave a good place and go to a hard place? And they said, if, if, if you go to Canada, they said, no one will know where you are. They just, like, no one will know how to help you. Like, you'll just, you'll just be lost. He said, no one will know where you are. And my dad's response was, God will know where I am. And as long as God knows where I am, I'm going with God. And so my dad did. Well, dad did lots of great things in, over the years, but uh, he wrote Experiencing God, uh, uh, became just a very popular Christian book. And I can't go anywhere in the world. Literally, I, I've been in Cuba. I've been in China. I've been in South Africa. I've been in all kinds of places. I have never gone to a country yet where someone did not come up and tell me what a blessing my father was to them, how what my dad wrote and what my dad did was a blessing to them. People said, you're crazy to do it. But I, I look back now and I realize a whole lot of people would never have been blessed if my dad hadn't had the courage just to step out and go. And you know, sometimes you don't know it at the time. You know, I, I think, think some of our disappointment sometimes is we just don't know the end of the story yet. We, don't, we, we look around our lives sometimes and think, well, what, what's really happened with my life? And you don't always know right now. But later you look back and you realize, boy, God did a lot. And so... So God comes to Abram and he, and he says, I've got this plan to make you truly a, a blessing, but you're going to have to do what I tell you to do. And so you get to verse 4, and it starts off, at least in my translation, with just a two-letter word, so, S-O. And you, you wouldn't think that's a big word, right? Like, that's just a word you kind of skip right over to get to the, the important words, right? But what, what does the word so indicate? When you see the word so, what often does it, oftentimes, what does that mean? It's kind of a hinge word, right? Like God will say something, and then there'll be so. And what comes right after that? Pretty important what comes right after that, right? God speaks. By the way, every time God speaks to you, there's a so. Every time God speaks, there's a, whether it's there or not in writing, there's a so. And what comes after that is your response. God told Abram an amazing, impossible thing. And then it says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. Isn't that awesome? But sometimes that's not what it says in the Bible. Sometimes it says, so the rich young ruler went away very sad. <laughs> right? He heard from Jesus and that his so was, you're asking too much. Sometimes it says, so Andrew and Peter got out of their fishing boats and they followed Jesus. Uh, Fortunately, when Abraham gets the word from God, he gets up and he goes. And notice just, I'm just going to kind of pass through a couple of these verses very quickly here. But it says, uh, verse 6, Abraham passed through the land to the site of Shechem, which is kind of in the middle of Israel. 
at the Oak of Morah, at that time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and A on the east. He built an altar to the Lord there and he called on the name of the Lord. So basically every time, like there's no temples right now to God. There's no synagogues to God. So every time Abram sort of hears from God, he builds an altar. Builds it out of stones. He wor- it's, a, it's a worship site. He, he worships God. He hears from God. And, uh, and so you can tell every time God speaks to Abram because there's another altar. And it's just like a trail. And, and my dad, if you've ever been through his book, Experiencing God, he calls these spiritual markers. It's like, hey, if God just told me to do something, I better mark this down. Because things may get hard down the road. Things may get confusing down the road, and I may need to come back to this altar and remember what God told me when I was listening and I heard clearly what he had to say. And so all the way along Abram's journey, he keeps putting down these, building these, these altars, and all's going well. And, and Abram basically, in this early part of the chapter, he goes all the way to the bottom of Canaan. I think what he's doing is he's checking out the real estate. Like, God said all this will be mine one day. I'm, I'm checking it out. Which, by the way, is not a bad thing to do. If God gives you a promise, I don't think it hurts to kind of scope it out and say, God, this isn't mine today. I'm not, I can't hold on to it today, but I just like to just... To imagine. Sometimes, you know, I, I know that when Mike and, and Sarah moved here to Oak Bay... They would drive around Oak Bay to say, God, I feel like you're giving this. You know, it's not like you'll all own Oak Bay, but God's kingdom will be spread here. And God is claiming this area and saying, this will be mine one day. This, this will be to the glory of God. And that doesn't mean it happens right away, but sometimes it's fun to imagine, isn't it? Sometimes it's fun to prayer walk and say, God, I, I almost feel like Abram's kind of prayer walking Canaan and just saying, one day this will all belong to the people of God. And God will be glorified in this place. And so it's great. Isn't it awesome, right? And then, but then you get to verse 10. And that's really the point. That's kind of the preamble. And I'll, I won't be as long in the after part. Uh, but it's, it's going so great for Abram, right? Like God spoke. He, he got up and he went. He's building altars. He's hearing from God. Like this is awesome, right? And then verse 10, it says, there was a famine in the land. If you're a shepherd, if you're in agriculture, famines are not good, right? Everything dies off. There's no food. There's no, nothing for your sheep and cattle to eat. You can't, have, you can't grow crops. It's devastating. And you, and you have to ask yourself, God, like Abram did everything you told him to do, right? Like you, he, he traveled hundreds of miles, on foot probably, or maybe on his camel, and he, and he got all the way to Canaan. He's built you these altars. He's worshipped you. He's obeyed you. Why would you let a famine strike now? I know some of you have been in those famines where you did everything God told you to do, and instead of a bumper crop of harvest, a famine struck. Everything dried up. It's not prosperous like you thought it would be. It's not celebrating success like you thought you would be. Instead, you're just trying to hold on. Why does God let his people go through famines? By the way, you know what's going to happen with Isaac, Abram's son? He's going to go through his own famine. And you know what's going to happen with Jacob? He's going to have a famine. He's going to move to to, to, to Egypt, and his relatives will stay there for 400 years. Every generation of patriarch went through a famine. I don't know why God does that. I, I'm not, I don't know what God knows. But I'm telling you, don't be caught by surprise when you think you've got everything planned out and then a famine strikes. And so notice what Abram does in his response. It says, again, the word, in verse 10, the word so comes up again. So, now what you wish you would read is it would say, so Abram went back to the altar to check in with God to make sure that what God wanted him to do. Wouldn't that be great? But, but that's not what he does. By the way, it's interesting. Whenever, whenever Abram's getting it right, he's communing with God. He's going to the altar. He's hearing God speak to him. Whenever he gets it wrong, all of a sudden he's not going to the altar anymore. 
That's interesting. Have you ever noticed people that when they're in church every week, when they're in God's Word every week, things can, you know, they're, they, it may not be easy, but they're hanging in there with God. And then when all of a sudden they stop, they don't stop showing up at church or they stop, you know, the, coming to the Bible study, you start to worry. And, and Abram, all of a sudden, he's not going to the altar anymore. So it says, Abram went down to Egypt to stay there for a while. Now, did God, offer, did God promise to give him Egypt as a promised land? He didn't tell him to go to Egypt, right? Where did, he, God, where did God tell Abram to go? To Canaan, right? This Egypt thing is Abram's idea. It's not God's idea. Now, now you could say, well, he's going to starve to death if he stays in Canaan. Well, maybe, but God's done bigger miracles than that, hasn't he? He didn't check with God. He just... He just, took it, he just kind of figured it out himself. And in verse 11, it says, When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, Look, I know that you are, what a beautiful woman you are. Now that's, that's starting out pretty good. I'm saying this, Abram, he's been married a while. He, he's got that down. But then notice what he says. He says, When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but let you live. Please say you're my sister, so it will go well for me because of you, and my life will be spared on your account. And what do you think of Abram at this point? Does he sound like a patriarch to you? Does he sound like the father of the faithful to you? When God said he's going to make a great name out of Abram, what he was saying is, Abram, you don't have a great character right now. But I'm going to give you a great character. Uh, now, how many years is it going to take God to, to, before he gives Abram a son? It'd be 25 years, right? Why, how long does it take God to give someone a baby? Like nine months, right? Nine months. Why does it take God 25 years? Well, I think you're seeing right here. Because Abram's not ready to raise an Isaac yet. Uh, by the way, you know, I, 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 this is just a little aside, just real quickly here. But one of the reasons, if you have kids or you have grandkids, one of the reasons you need to get it right with God as quickly as you can is because your kids are watching your character right now. And if you've got a character like this, you don't want an Isaac watching what you're doing. You don't want them to pick up this kind of deception. By the way, do you notice what Abram says? Do you notice the pronouns he's using? Like, it won't go, I want it to go well for me. I don't want them to kill me. So if you would just lie for me, then I'll live. It doesn't matter that you may get pulled into the king's harem and have to, you know, fend for yourself. At least I'll be doing okay. Wow, pretty selfish, right? And yet he's going to be, God, what did God say he was going to do for Abram? Make him a blessing to everybody. Doesn't sound like a blessing, does he? In fact, notice what it says. So it says that when, when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh. So the woman was, was taken to Pharaoh's household. He treated Abram well because of her. And Abram acquired flocks and herds, male and female donkeys, male and female slaves and camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So, so what, how's, Her, so, how is, uh, how's Sarah doing at this point? She's been pulled into a harem by the Pharaoh, trying to, you know, you can imagine what her life is like. How's Pharaoh doing? He's, he's, he's got the plagues of heaven coming down on, on Egypt. It's going terrible for him. How's, how's Abram doing? He's getting rich. <laughs> Abram's giving him all this money and cattle and slaves and money. Like, he's just getting rich. But that's not what God told him to do, right? God didn't tell him to get rich. God told him he's going to be a blessing. And no one in Abram's life is being blessed right now. His wife's not being blessed. Pharaoh's not being blessed. Canaan's not being blessed. Only one who's making it rich is Abram. And by the way, you know what's kind of sad? When does Abram finally confess what's going on? When does, he, does his guilt, does his conscience get to him after a while? But he's like, you know, I kind of feel, every time I walk by the Pharaoh's palace, I kind of feel guilty. My wife's trying to fend off Pharaoh over there. You know, I should maybe just go ahead and tell the truth. When, when does Abram finally admit what happened? He doesn't, right? Pharaoh finally figures it out. Which, by the way, this is a smarter Pharaoh than the Pharaoh that Moses will deal with about four centuries later. This Pharaoh doesn't like plagues. Like once the plagues start coming, he's like, hey, how do we deal with this? Let's get this thing taken care of. And so he, he figures it out, 
And he says, why did you say she's my sister? Which, by the way, Sarah is Abram's half-sister. They have the same uh, father, different mother, diff same father. So they are technically half. He's, he's telling a white lie. He's, he's, he's being deceptive, but he's, he's figured out how to stretch the truth to save his own skin. And so Pharaoh says, take her and go. Then Pharaoh sent his men orders about him, and they sent him away with his wife and all he had. And he goes back. So at this point, this is probably one of the lowest, most despicable points in Abram's life. Um, God gives him this great promise, and then what does he do? He lets a famine come in, and it reveals some pretty ugly things about Abram. And it's like God saying, it's going to take a while until I can entrust an Isaac to you at this point, because you just don't have the character that I'm looking for. But don't worry, because God is not easily discouraged. And so just, I'm going to just close, but, but just notice, if I just kind of review just very quickly chapter 13, do you know what, what's going to happen there? It's going to say that, that Abram leaves with all of his money, and it says, he go, in verse 3, he went by stages. In other words, he's, he's going to try to find his way back to God. He's really messed up. There's no reference to, to Abram ever calling out to God while he's in Egypt. Now he's going to go back to Cain. He's going to go back to the place God told him to go in the first place. And when he gets there, it's, it says he's going to go to Bethel. And I, he's going to go back to the last altar that he worshiped God at. And, you know, I've often, when I've counseled people that have come and they've said, you know, I've gotten off track with God. I was really on fire for God for a while, and then I kind of got off track, and I, you know, I'm I just not in the place with God that I know I should be. Uh, you know, when the, and they'll say, but how do I get back? How do I get back to a close walk with God again? One of the first things I'll say is, well, where is the last place God told you to be? What's the last thing God told you to do? Get back to that place. Get back there. And so what does Abram do? He goes back to the, the last altar where God spoke to him. And he says, God, I'm so, I, I, I wish I knew what Abram said there. I can imagine Abram saying, God, I'm so embarrassed. I'm just so embarrassed. You, you promised so much and one, one famine and I'm hitting the panic button and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm selling out my wife and I'm lying and I'm like, I just don't like what this revealed about me. And I think that may have been the whole purpose of the famine anyway, to let Abram see, I'm, I've got great things for your life, but hey, I just wanted you to kind of get a glimpse into the character you have right now. And, uh, and then, by the way, do you know what happens at the end of that chapter? Remember the story where, where Abram and, and Lot, they're, they're, you know, all their herds are getting crowded together and they're starting to, the shepherds are fighting. And so Abram goes to Lot, his nephew, and says, look, on this side is lush, green pastures. Over here is desert. I'm going to let you pick what you want. Now, this is a nephew, right? The way it works is the old guy gets to pick first. Ab Abram should have been able to pick the nice land, but he doesn't. He says, you go ahead and pick, because I've learned one thing. When you're in God's will, does, you, can, you can thrive in a desert, you can thrive in lush pasture. It doesn't make any difference to God. He can bless you just as much. And so Abram does one of the most noble things he ever does in his life. He, he lets his younger, ungrateful nephew take the good land, and he goes out to a desert. And when he gets there, God says, well done, Abraham. You kind of messed up earlier on. Already you're showing the character I knew that you had and I'm going to make you to have. So I, just, I don't know where you are. You may be in a famine right now, a hard place, a dry place, a disappointing place. But, it, but with God, God never ends with a famine. Famines are tests. They, they reveal some things. They shape some things. They fashion our character. But God did not create you for a famine. On the other side of the famine... God wants you to be a blessing and to be a much greater blessing than you could imagine. So I'm going to just take a moment to pray for you. And, uh, and you know, I, I know that you, you might want to even just share with Mike sometime after the service or this week to say, you know, I, I just feel like there's a lot hinging right now. On to say, I feel like I'm facing one of those sows in my life. I feel like I know what God's told me to do and I just want to make sure I get it right because there's a, there's a whole lot at stake. And so let me just pray, and, uh, and then the worship team will lead us. Lord, thank you for being a God 
who delights in making us a blessing. And Lord, I, I, I just have to trust in your infinite wisdom that sometimes in your perfect will, you let us go through a famine, a hard place, a, a disappointing place. And God, I pray that when that time comes, you'll help us uh, to go through it well, to hold on to you even when it's hard, when life is not turning out the way we thought it would. But Lord, may we still cling to you, bring glory to you, and be a blessing to those in our life as a result. Speak to us this week. And Lord, if some of us perhaps are not in the place that we should be right now, help us to make our way back to Bethel, back to that last place you told us to be. And Lord, thank you for being gracious and always willing for us to return to you and to begin walking closely with you once again. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks, Dad. You know, as we, as we journey together, Jesus would go on to say that we are to be a light in our world. Uh, light dispels darkness. In other words, we are to be a blessing to the places we go. And so that was, that was Abraham's journey. And God has each of us on a journey, too. And, uh, and I believe that in some ways, uh, Victoria is our Canaan. A lot of differences, right? It's uh, we're completely the other side of the world. And yet I believe that God has us here as a church to be a light, to be disciples that would say, we want to make a difference in our city. We want our city to be blessed because we are here. Uh, there's a couple ways, just practical ways, if you're looking like, what, what's the next step of what I can do uh, t to be part of that? Uh, let me give you just two things before, uh, before Jake and Kim and Tanishka close us uh, in song. Uh, one is, uh, is a backpack initiative. We're partnering with, uh, with One Up. They're, uh, uh, they're a group in our city that tries to uh, come alongside of uh, single parent homes and, and uh, kind of give, uh, uh, give them some help. Uh, the school year coming up can be kind of an expensive time. And so, uh, and so uh, after we close, uh, I would encourage you to, to head over to that little uh, backpack display. Uh, the way that works is uh, you can get a, grab a backpack or grab several. Uh, decide which grade that you want to, uh, you want to take. There's uh, all the way from K to 12 represented on there. Say, so I want to I do a kindergarten one or I want to do a grade three. Um, and then uh, and the folks we have at the table are going are gonna to give you uh, a packing list specifically for that. So don't sign, sign it out on your own. We're kind of keeping track of it all. They'll give you a packing list for that. And, uh, and then uh, I encourage you to, to go to Staples or Walmart or wherever. Uh, fill that backpack for a kid. Those are all called, um, those are all been asked for. We're not just filling backpacks hoping that kids will do it. People have signed up with one up saying we need this. And so every backpack has a kid on the other end attached to it already. And so, uh, so we've got 50 of them. Uh, we're partnering with, uh, with Kim's Church, Saanich Baptist, and Colwood Church is also helping. And, uh, and so grab one of those, sign it out, fill it up uh, in a couple weeks. We're going we're gonna to need them all back, but uh, just a practical way to, to bless our city. The other way is uh, Family Fest. There's a little sign-up sheet at the table, information table over there. Uh, if you're able to come and help us on uh, August 13th, which is just a couple weeks away, uh, it's a big gift to the families in our city uh, because we want to be a blessing to our city. And so, uh, so let me ask you to, uh, to stand, and uh, let's close tonight. By, by singing truth, uh, that, that God might fill us, that as we go, wherever we are on our journey, you can trust God to lead you, uh, to be a blessing, uh, even as he blesses you, to pass that on to others. So Jake and Kim, why don't you lead us, and then we'll be finished tonight. Awesome. So we sang this song a little bit earlier, and... Um... Yeah, if you're in a place where you feel like you need that extra just bit of hope, this is a song that um, I really love. It's one of my favorite worship songs, and it just looks towards that ultimate hope that we have in Jesus. So let's sing this together. Then came the morning. Then came the morning that 
We've heard a lot of truth tonight, and I kind of find um, for myself there's often certain words, uh, certain lyrics in the songs that we sing. You kind of hear me pray them pretty frequently at the end of uh, worship time. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and certain you know, things that maybe Richard has said. Uh, in the service or in the in his sermon tonight, um, some of those lyrics or some of those uh, words might stick with us throughout the week. Um, if you find that to be true, I encourage you to just press into them, uh, pray through them, and uh, yeah, let's walk forward into this week just in the hope that we have uh, maybe in the midst of of a desert season, but we still have that hope. Yeah. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>